And um, okay, so now that we're recording, just uh, today is our last class until the first Sunday after Labor Day. And um, we're on the bottom of page uh, 44 in the Koran edition. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, shekit shana b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. So here, uh, we're, we're continuing the discussion from the Mishnah about these various Roman holidays and what they are. So the Mishnah teaches, and Kratesis, uh, or if we pronounce it the way the vowels are here, Keratesis. So Keratesis, and the day of the festival of their kings. The Gemara asks, what is the festival of Keratesis? Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel said, it commemorates the day when Rome seized control of an empire. The Gemara asks, but isn't it taught in a Baraita two festivals of Keratesis and the day when Rome seized control of an empire? This indi indicates that Keratesis and the day when Rome seized control of an empire are two separate festivals. So the conflicting ideas among the rabbis as to what Keratesis is, um, which could make sense because, again, Babylonian rabbis are a little bit removed from the Roman Empire, living in the Persian Empire, and may have forgotten the tradition of a few generations before when rabbis were living under the Roman Empire in the land of Israel. So it, it could be understood why the tradition kind of uh, morphed and uh, was no longer clear. So um, Rav Yosef said, to try to clarify this now, on two separate occasions, Rome seized control of an empire. One occurred in the days of Queen Cleopatra when they conquered Egypt, and one happened much earlier when Rome seized control in the days of the Greeks. So, uh, in the days of Queen, Cle Queen Cleopatra, here, this is, so here, this is the Egyptian Queen Cleopatra VII, the last ruler of Egypt. The Gemara is apparently referring to the conquest of Egypt in the time of Augustus Caesar in 3031 CE, which began Rome's complete control over the Middle East. Now, they defeated the, the Greek Empire and took control of the land of Israel a hundred years before that in, well, not, maybe not a hundred years, 60 years before that, in 63 or 66 BCE. Um, at that time, the Roman Senate declared this day, the 30th of August of the year 30, a holiday and proclaimed it the first day of the new calendar. The new festival was celebrated for several years to come, and every five years, the Romans would hold special events, which included worship of the emperor and lavish circus acts. Okay, so we do have records from the Roman Empire of what Keratesis could have been. So, and the, uh, the defeat of Egypt as a new day for the Roman Empire. So now, uh, and then the defeat of the Greek Empire is, is another one. So now we're going to talk about that. The Gemara elaborates. As when Rav Dimi came from Eretz Israel, he said, the Romans waged 32 battles with the Greeks, but were unable to defeat them until they formed a partnership with the Jewish people and finally vanquished the Greeks. And this is the condition that they stipulated with the Jewish people. If the kings come from among us, the governors, hiparche, uh, the governors will come from among you. And if the kings come from among you, the governors will come from among us. Um, so a little bit of background here that the Talmud gives us, 32 battles. It's difficult to gauge the precise number of battles or wars fought between the Romans and the Greeks. There were many wars and battles fought between these two nations, for example, the Pyrrhic Wars and the Mithridate, Mithridatic Wars, some of which were won by the Greeks. It was only after 200 years of conflict that the Romans became the decisive victors. Okay, so 
so that's the agreement that um, if we are the kings, then you'll be the governors. If you're the kings, then we're the governors. So you kind of think about King Herod and then Pontius Pilate. Uh, so, you know, maybe there's some reference to that. And the Romans sent the following message to the Greeks. Until now, we attempted to resolve our conflict through fighting battles. Now let us settle the matter by means of judgment. In the case of a pearl and a precious stone, which one of them should serve as a base for the other? And the Greeks sent them in response, the pearl should serve as the base for the precious stone, which has a greater value. Uh, so I'm not sure what this what this whole back and forth is going to get us to, but let's see. That's the beginning of a story of the difference between the Romans and Greeks in terms of their uh, kind of thinking. Okay, so what's better, a pearl or a precious stone for the base, for the other? So the Greeks said, pearl should serve as the base for the precious stone, which has a greater value. The Romans further inquired, if there was a precious stone and an onyx, a particularly valuable precious stone, which one of them should serve as a base for the other? The Greeks answered, the Greeks answered, the precious stone should serve as the base for the onyx. Once again, the Romans asked, in the case of an onyx and a Torah scroll, which one of them should, should, be, ser should serve as a base for the other? The Greeks responded, the onyx should serve as the base for the Torah scroll. The Romans sent this response to them. If that is so, then you should submit to us as we have the Torah scroll with us and the Jewish people are with us. The Romans are akin to the precious stone and they are allied with the Jewish people who are akin to the onyx and they possess the Torah scroll. The Romans therefore forced the Greeks to surrender and took over their world dominance. For 26 years, the Romans stood faithfully with the Jewish people from that point forward, they subjugated them. So this is a, so I've, I've, I have no idea what this Midrash is. I've never come across this Midrash before, uh, but it's, it's interesting that, they're, that the rabbis are claiming that the Romans and the Greeks were having this philosophical, philosophical discussion about the Jews uh, related to who should be um, the mightier people in the world? Should it be the Greeks or the Romans? And the Greeks said, well, we got the Jews on our side, so that makes us uh, uh, dominant in the world. So it's, it's just uh, interesting that the rabbis would come up with a midrash like this, that they would dare um, claim that they had that the Jews had any kind of of stake in this uh, political uh, discussion between the Greeks and the Romans. So the the Gemara asks, initially when the Romans acted faithfully, what verse did they interpret? And ultimately when they subjugated the Jews, what verse did they interpret? Initially, they interpret the verse where Esau said to Jacob upon their meeting, let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before you. In this verse, Esau equates himself to Jacob, prefiguring the initial Roman treatment of the Jews. And ultimately, they interpreted the verse that recites Jacob's response to Esau, let my Lord, I pray you, pass over before his servant, demonstrating Jacob's subjugation to Esau and by extension, that of the Jews to Rome. So now, uh, according to the rabbis, the um, Esau in the Torah is the ancestor of the Roman Empire. So any place in the Torah in which Esau is referred to is seen as a reference also, uh, a prophecy about the Roman Empire. So, because of the relationship between Jacob and Esau, the rabbis see that as the, the basis in the Torah for the relationship between the Roman Empire and the Jews. And the rabbis do this in order to try to explain 
why situation in the world is the way it is for the Jews. And claiming that the Torah, the being the source of all knowledge, and God knowing best and setting up different uh, empires around the world, see the, the Torah as the basis, the rabbis see the Torah as the basis for understanding why things are the way they are in the world today. And if we had only, if Jacob had only treated his brother Esau better, perhaps Jews would have been treated better by the Roman Empire. So that's, that's the rabbi's way of understanding what's happening in their time, the destruction of the temple, uh, being oppressed by the Romans, uh, finding basis for that in the Torah with Jacob and Esau. Okay, and that's not the only thing that they do uh, with using the Torah as, an ex as a basis for that, but that's a, this is a, a clear example uh, of this. So the Gemara asks, with regard to the 26 years during which the Romans stood faithfully with the Jewish people, from where do we know that this was the case? Like, what's the basis? What's the proof text that there would be 26 years of good relations with the Romans? The Gemara cites a proof. As Rav Kahana says, when Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yosei, fell ill, the sages sent the following message to him. Our teacher, tell us two or three statements that you once told us in the name of your father, Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta, as we do not remember the statements precisely. Rabbi Ishmael, son of Rabbi Yossi, said to them, the following statements that were passed down to him, uh, the, said to them the following statements that were passed down to him by his father. 180 years before the second temple was destroyed, the evil Roman Empire stretched forth over Israel and ruled over them. 80 years before the temple was destroyed, the sages decreed impurity on the land of the nations and on glass vessels. Forty years before the temple was destroyed, the Sanhedrin was exiled from the chamber of, humans, of hewn stone and um, <clears throat> sat in the store near the temple mount. Just um, a little bit of background here. Um, just one second here, the store. Various sources indicate that there was a shopping area in the vicinity of the Temple Mount, perhaps located at the foot of its western side. The Sanhedrin moved there. <clears throat> the foot of the western side of the Temple Mount would be the foot of the western wall. And in fact, <clears throat> that is the case <clears throat> if anybody's been to the Kotel, but not the Kotel itself. If you picture in your mind's eye, on the right-hand side of the Kotel Plaza area is this ramp that goes up to the Temple Mount. On the other side of that ramp is the archeological area where the egalitarian Kotel is. If you are in that area where the egalitarian Kotel is, you are in an area where the Western wall meets the Southern wall. And at that place, if you are at the foot of the Western wall, you'll see remnants of arches. And all archaeologists, archaeologists agree that those are storefronts, that these would be places where uh, vendors would be selling things that people would need at the last second to get into the temple area. So there would be uh, people selling pigeons or turtle doves and things like that. So yes, this area could be the area of stores that um, the Gemara here is talking about and where the um, Sanhedrin might have met uh, in the last few years before the temple was destroyed. So, um, right, so according to Rabbi Yishmael, he's passing on these ideas. 180 years before the temple was destroyed, the Roman Empire stretched forth over Israel. 80 years before the temple was destroyed, the sages decreed impurity on the land of the nations and on glass vessels. 40 years before the temple was destroyed, the Sanhedrin was exiled from the chamber of hewn, hewn stone and sat in the store near the temple mount. Now, 30 years before the temple was destroyed is around the time of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus. So just putting it out there in context here. So now, the Gemara asks, <clears throat> with, the, 
with regard to what halacha is it necessary to know where the Sanhedrin would convene? Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Avdimi said, it's necessary in order to say that they no longer judged cases of fines. The Gemara asks, so let me just, there's an end there. Um, what's the end? Oh, this is referring to all cases where one is liable to pay more than an amount of the damage that he caused or where Torah law fixes the amount that must be paid. It includes the liability of a thief to pay the double payment, the fourfold or fivefold payment of one who steals and sells a sheep or ox, and the 30 silver coins paid when one's ox gores a Canaanite slave. Only ordained judges may adjudicate these cases. Ordination can be performed only by an ordained judge and ordination must take, must take place in Eretz Yisrael. So that's the issue here. Uh, if, the, if the Sanhedrin is still there in the land of Israel, then it's okay. They can still adjudicate all these, all these cases. Uh, the Gemara asks, does it enter your mind that at this point the Sanhedrin no longer judge cases of fines? But doesn't Rav Yehuda say that Rav says, indeed, that man will be remembered favorably. And Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava is his name, as had it not been for him, the laws of fines would have been forgotten from among the Jewish people. The Gemara challenges that assertion. Would the laws of fines actually have been forgotten? Let the scholars study them so they will not be forgotten. Rather, his intention was to say that the law of fines would have ceased to be implemented from among the Jewish people, as they would not have been able to adjudicate cases involving these halachot due to a lack of ordained judges. This is because at one time, the wicked kingdom of Rome issued decrees of, re of religious persecution against the Jewish people with the aim of abolishing the chain of ordination and the authority of the sages. They said that anyone who ordains judges will be killed and anyone who is ordained will be killed and the city in which they ordain the judges will be destroyed, and the areas around the boundary of the city in which they ordain judges will be uprooted. These measures were intended to discourage the sages from performing or receiving ordination due to fear for the welfare of the local population. Right, so this is, this is some of the history that's being presented here of what life was like under the Romans and how it was uh, difficult to teach Judaism and to be Jewish especially in public uh, during, during that time. So what did Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava do? He went and sat between, the two, between two large mountains and between, between two large cities and between two Shabbat boundaries, between Usha and Shafar Am. And so there's uh, a map here of where Usha and Shafar Am are. And right here, this is around where Haifa is, and this is a little bit inland here in this in the Jezreel Valley today. Okay, so he's saying that um, that is in a desolate place was that was not associated with any particular city. Said he would not endanger anyone not directly involved, and there he ordained five elders, namely Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Yose, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shemua. And Rav Avia adds that Rabbi Nehemiah was also among those ordained. So these are, this is an example of the lengths that the rabbis went to to try to circumvent um, the, the Romans and try to ensure the, con the, the continuity of Jewish scholarship and Jewish leadership. When their enemies discovered them, Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava said to the newly ordained rabbis, my sons, run for your lives. They said to him, our teacher, and what will be with you? Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava was elderly and unable to run. He said to them, in any case, I am cast before them like a stone that cannot be overturned. Even if you attempt to assist me, I will not be able to escape due to my frailty. But if you do not escape without me, you will also be killed. People said about this incident, the Roman soldiers did not move from there until they had inserted 300 iron spears into his body, making his body appear like a sieve pierced with many holes. And it can be inferred from this episode that there were ordained judges who could hear cases of fines for many years after the destruction of the temple, in contrast to Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Avdimi's 
statement. So, in other words, Yehuda ben Bava defied the Romans. He ordained judges. Romans came. Uh, the, the five newly ordained rabbis ran for their lives and were able to escape and were able to continue the tra tradition of ordained rabbis in Israel, but Yehuda ben Bava was killed. Now, this story happens to appear in the martyrology service on Yom Kippur. So it's one of the stories of rabbis who uh, became martyrs in the time of the Romans. So his body became like a sieve. That's, that was just a statement that um, reminded me of, uh, of the martyrology service uh, cases in, that's in the Machzor on Yom Kippur of people who um, died for the sake of maintaining Jewish values. Um, okay, so now we go on. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says an explanation. Do not say that after the Sanhedrin was ex exiled from the chamber of, of hewn stone, they no longer judge cases of fines. Rather, amend the statement to say that they no longer judge cases of capital law, as a court does not have the authority to hear capital cases when the Sanhedrin is not sitting in the chamber of hewn stone. So this chamber of hewn stone is a place in the temple area where the Sanhedrin met. And there's this tradition that the rabbis are saying that um, capital cases, murder cases, can only be tried in the Sanhedrin in that particular chamber. And if they're not there, then capital cases can't be tried. The Gemara explains, what's the reason that the members of the Sanhedrin ceased to meet in their proper place and thereby ended the adjudication of capital cases? Once they saw that the murderers were so numerous and they were not able to judge them and punish them with death, they said it's better that we should be exiled from a chamber of hewn stone and move from place to place so that offenders will not be able, will not be deemed liable to receive the death penalty in a time period when the court does not carry out their sentences. So much anarchy, chaos in the country is just better that we're going from place to place than having to deal with all these murderers. The Gemara explains why a court may not adjudicate capital cases once the Sanhedrin has left the chamber of hewn stone, as it is written, and you shall do according to the tenor of the sentence, which they shall declare to you from that place. Right, so the verse says uh, that place. This verse teaches that it is the place where the Sanhedrin resides that causes the judgment to take place. In other words, if the Sanhedrin has abandoned its proper place, the chamber of hewn stone, all courts must cease judging capital cases. The Gemara returns to the earlier comment of Rabbi Yishmael in the name of his father, Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta, that the Roman Empire ruled over Israel 180 years before the second temple was destroyed. The Gemara asks, did Rome rule over Israel for 180 years before the destruction of the temple and no more? But didn't Rabbi Yossi the Great, that is Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta himself teach, the Persian Empire, which, which ruled the world before the construction of the temple, continued to do so for 34 years in the presence of the temple, that is, after the temple was built. The Greek Empire ruled for 180 years in the presence of the temple. The Hasmonean dynasty, dynasty ruled for 103 years in the presence of the temple. And the Herodian dynasty likewise ruled for 103 years. From this point forward, you can go and calculate the date on which an event occurred by how many years it happened after the destruction of the temple. According to this statement of Rabbi Yossi, evidently when the Greek rule over the Jewish people ended and the Roman rule began, it was 206 years before the second temple was destroyed. That is the two sets of 103 years of the Hasmonean dynasty and the Herodian dynasty. But you said that when the Roman Empire stretched forth over Israel and ruled over them, it was 180 years before the temple was destroyed. This is not a contradiction, but rather it proves that for 26 years, the Romans stood faithfully with the Jewish people, honoring their agreement and did not subjugate them. And therefore, Rabbi Ishmael, son of Rabbi Yose, did, does not count these 26 years among the total years in which the evil Roman Empire stretched forth over Israel 
and ruled over them. So the rabbis are reconciling history as they know it with the Greeks, the Hasmoneans, the Herodians, the Romans, etc. Okay, so now uh, on to a different uh, topic. Apropos the above Baraita, the Gemara relates the, that Rav Papa said, if this Tana, that is one who dates years in reference to the destruction of the temple, forgot and did not know the details oh. of the date with regard to exact, uh, exactly how much time had passed since the destruction of the temple. For example, he remembered the century but could not recall the exact decade and year. Let him ask a scribe who writes official documents how many years he writes when, when he dates the documents. The dating system of scribes uses as its starting point the beginning of the Greek rule, 300 years before the destruction of the temple. And let him add 20 years to the number, and in this manner, he will find his number. And your mnemonic to remember this is the verse, these 20 years have I been in your house. So here, understanding how we're dating things based on Roman versus Greek rule. Similarly, if a scribe forgot the exact year, let him ask the Tana how much time he calculates has passed since the temple's destruction, and he should deduct from the number 20 years, and in this manner, he will find his number. And your mnemonic to remember that the Tana adds 20 to the date of the scribe, whereas the scribe deducts 20 from the number of the Tana is as follows. A scribe deducts while a Tana adds on. This is a play on the phrase Tana Tosfa'a, which also means to teach the Tosefta, the practice of a Tana. All right, so just this idea of, of dating here of uh, uh, in relation to destruction of the temple and the Greek empire and the Roman empire. In relation to the discussion of the calculation of years, the Gemara states that one of the sages of the school of Eliyahu taught, the world is destined to exist for 6,000 years. For 2,000 years, the world was waste, as the Torah had not yet been given. The next set of 2,000 years are the time period of the Torah. The last set of 2,000 years are the period designated for the days of the Messiah. But due to our many sins, there are those years that have been taken from them. That is, such and such years have already passed and have been taken from the 2,000 years that are designated for the Messiah, and the Messiah has not yet arrived. Whenever Atana taught this Baraita, he would insert the number of years that was correct for his time. So how many years are added till we get to the time of the Messiah? The Gemara asks, with regard to the 2,000 years of the time period of the Torah, from when are they counted? If we say that they started from the giving of the Torah until now, then there is not enough time for all these years. As when you examine the calculations, it's evident that from the creation of the world, until the giving of the Torah, there were 2,000 years plus a part of this third thousand, as the Torah was given 2,448 years after the creation of the world. This would mean that the time period of the Torah encroaches upon the days of the Messiah. Rather, the 2,000-year time period of the Torah is counted from the time when it's stated about Abraham and Sarah and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, which is interpreted by the sages as referring to the men and women who are brought closer to the Torah by Abraham and Sarah. Therefore, it was at this point that the Torah began to spread throughout the world, and it's learned as a tradition that at that time, Abraham was 52 years old. Okay, so now we're getting into this deep midrash about, um, about <clears throat> uh, chronology, history here, trying to fit things into um, years according to the rabbis. How many years are missing from the 2,000 year period of the Messiah if the period of the Torah that is taught by the Tana is counted from the giving of the Torah? There are 448 missing years. When you examine the calculation of the time when it is stated about Abraham and Sarah, the souls that they had gotten in Haran until the time of the giving of the Torah, there are 448 years. With regard to this Baraita as well, Rav Papa said, if a Tana meant to state that at this time, such and such years were already lost from the 2,000 years that are designated for the days of the Messiah, but he forgot and did not know the details of exactly how much time had passed, let him ask a scribe how many years he writes when he dates documents, and let him add 48 to the number, correcting for the century, 
And in this manner, he will find his number. And your, mon your mnemonic for this is the verse, 48 cities. Similarly, if a scribe forgot the exact year, let him ask the Tana, how many years does he teach have already been lost from the 2,000 years that are designated for the days of the Messiah? And he should duct, deduct 48 years from the number, correcting for the century, and in this manner, he will find his number. And you're a mnemonic to remember that the Tana must add to the date of the scribe, while the scribe must deduct from the number of the Tana is, again, a scribe deducts while a, while a Tana adds on. Okay, so bizarre kind of midrash here about dating, taking first from the Roman and Greek Empire, and now to uh, the Jewish history. Um, so now, Rav Huna, son of Rab Rabbi Rav Yehoshua says, in the case of one who does not know which year of the seven-year sabbatical cycle he stands in, he should add one year to the years that have passed since the destruction of the temple in order to begin at the start of a sabbatical cycle. And he should calculate the general years, that is the centuries, as jubilee cycles, as every jubilee concludes seven completed sabbatical cycles of 49 years, and the details as, as sabbatical cycles, that is, he should divide the remaining years into seven-year sabbatical cycles. But as the jubilee year itself is counted as one year of a sabbatical cycle, he should take from every hundred years that pass two years, and add it to the details, that is, the remaining decades and single years. And then he should calculate with the details by dividing them into sabbatical cycles. And from the remainder, he will know how many years <clears throat> in the current sabbatical cycle have passed. And your mnemonic that two years must be deducted from every century is the following verse. For these two years, the famine has been in the land. Well, this could be one way in which rabbis in the land of Israel around the time of the Zionists <clears throat> right, when kibbutzim were first brought back and started in Israel and they wanted to calculate when the sabbatical year would be observed, they probably used this formula to figure it out. Rabbi Hanina says, after the year 400 from the destruction of the temple, if a person says to you, purchase a field that is worth 1,000 dinars for one dinar, do not purchase it. It's not a worthwhile investment as the redemption will soon come and all fields will revert to their original owners. It was taught in a Baraita after the year 4,231 from the creation of the world. If a person says to you, purchase a field that is worth 1,000 dinars for one dinar, do not purchase it. The Gemara asks, what's the difference between these two dates? The Gemara answers, there's a difference between them of three years as the Baraita adds three years. The Year 400 from the destruction of the temple corresponds to the year 4,228 from the creation of the world. So the rabbis are trying to figure out when the time of the Messiah would be. And really, in the time of the rabbis in the Talmud period, they think that they're near the time of the Messiah. Uh, 400 years from the destruction of the temple would be the year 470, and that's around the time of the editing of the Babylonian Talmud. So they were guessing uh, on these calculations that maybe the Messiah was at hand. Okay, so now on to another uh, tangent. The Gemara relates, there was a certain promissory note in which was written a date that had six additional years relative to the correct scribal date, which takes for its starting point the beginning of Greek rule. The sages who studied before Rabbah thought to say, this is a post-dated promissory note, which can be used only from the date it specifies. Therefore, let us hold it until its time arrives so that the creditor will not repossess property that the debtor bought prior to the date that appears in the note. Rav Nachman disagreed and said this promissory note was written by an exacting scribe, and those six years are referring to the years when the Greeks ruled only in Elam. We do not count them as Greek rule had not yet spread throughout the world, but he does count them, and therefore he wrote in the promissory note the correct time, as the date does in fact match the year in which the promissory note was written. So, you know, it's also interesting how the um, 
there are possibly different ways for people to understand what year we're in. So it's unlike, unlike the world today where everybody agrees it's 2022. Well, it's also 5782 according to the Jewish calendar. So if you're living in the Jewish world or in the ultra Orthodox world, you're in 5782. But if you're in the Muslim world, you have a different counting. You have a different calendar from the time of Muhammad. So you're in 1,600 something. And if you're in the Chinese world, maybe the Chinese have their, their counting system too. So, but it's, it's more, um, it's least, it, well, let's say it this way. Most people in the world today have the common counting system. So when we write a ketubah today, uh, the ketubah has on it both the, the English date, Right, so if we're if I was doing a wedding today, the ketubah would say uh, May uh, Sunday, the first day of the week, Sunday, May twenty first, twenty twenty two, which corresponds to the twentieth of ER fifty seven eighty two. So you have both dates there to be sure that everybody knows what the date is. So here we're talking about a time that maybe was uh, less agreed upon um, to know exactly what year we're in. And so that's, that's what the, uh, the rabbis are talking about here. Rav Nachman cites a proof for his resolution. As it is taught in a Baraita, the Rabbi Yossi says, the Greeks ruled for six years in Elam alone, and afterward their dominion spread throughout the entire world. It is the later event that serves as the basis for the dating system used by most scribes. Um, okay, and here's background. Greeks ruled for six years in Elam. The dating of years according to the Greek kings is referring to the system used by the Seleucid kings. Their enumeration starts with the year in which Seleucus uh, I, Nicator, declared himself the independent ruler of Elam, that is Babylonia, 3448 in the Hebrew calendar, or 312 BCE. Beforehand, Seleucus had ruled over Babylonia for five years until he was forced to flee. It was only after the failure of Antigonus Monophthalmus's attempt to unite and rule over all the lands conquered by Alexander the Great that Seleucus managed to return and reign over the province of Babylonia. In time, he managed to conquer Iran, Syria, and Asia Minor, rendering the Seleucid Empire the largest expansion ever of Greek rule. It's therefore possible that there was a different count starting from the year in which Seleucus first secured control over Babylonia rather than the year of his return. And here's a statue of him. Okay. We can go on a little bit more. Rav Achaba Yaakov objects to Rav Nachman's answer. From where is it known that we count years according to the Greek rule and that this promissory note was dated according to a system that uses the Greek rule as a starting point and was written by an exacting scribe? Perhaps we count the years using the exodus from Egypt as the starting point, which occurred 1,000 years before the start of the Greek rule. And in this case, the scribe left out the first 1,000 years from the time of the exodus and held only to the last 1,000 years, omitting the thousands digit and writing merely the hundreds, tens, and single digits. And if so, this promissory note is post-dated. Rav Nachman said in response, the practice is that in the exile, we count years only according to the Greek kings. Upon hearing this reply, Rav Achaba Yaakov thought, Rav Nachman is merely reflecting my legitimate questions with this answer. Afterward, he went out, examined the matter, and discovered that it was as Rav Nachman says. As it is taught in the Baraita, in the exile, we count years only according to the Greek kings. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to stop here for today because uh, a couple of things I have to do before the, the next class starts. And um, so quite the tangent from discussing uh, doing business with uh, Gentiles to understanding um, yeah, Arnie, just one second. Uh, um, doing business with Gentiles to understanding how we how we count the years. Yes, Arnie. Uh, my only question is why would there why would they deviate from counting the calendar based on the Jewish calendar only? 
I mean, I, I like we do, we sort of know in both. Um, and for right. Jewish purposes, so I, count, think, right, you know, I think the idea is that um, we want our documents to be recognized not only in for the Jewish people, but also in non-Jewish courts. So we have to have dates on it that everyone will understand. So if it, the ketubah has to be recognized in a, a non-Jewish court of law, and you can do that if you have a recognized uh, date on it. Um, so um, that um, so that's why I think they wanted to be sure that they had a date that uh, everybody would recognize. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll okay. accept that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, I wish everybody a good rest of the day and a uh, a cool summer. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start up again in Talmud class, uh, again, the first Sunday after Labor Day. Okay, Take safe care, travels. Safe travels. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Good.